Hello everybody, I'm Mr. Wildcat and welcome to another classic review for Married Children. Today we are going to be reviewing one of my favorite episodes from season 9 and prob and one of the very first episodes that I'd ever seen from the show, period. And my liking for this episode inspired me to continue watching the show as a whole. So today we're going to be reviewing and bingo was her game o okay <laughs> comes from the uh, comes from that famous children's uh, bingo song there was a farmer who had a dog and bingo was his name o b i n g o and bingo was his name o i'm not seeing the whole shit guys so don't don't even think about it <laughs> We have an episode to review. I'm not here to sing children's songs. I'm here to review Married with Children. <laughs> so this is the 21st episode to come out of Season 9. It, it, it basically um, is the episode right in between two other episodes from Season 9 that I have already reviewed. Um, the Larry Storch episode aired right before this. Something Larry Listway Comes. We reviewed that in honor of Larry Storch who passed away. And then we also did User Friendly, which aired after this, and that was reviewed in honor of Bob Rooney's interview with the Married Children Podcast. Boy, did I go to town with that one. And if any of you guys have not seen user, the User Friendly review, viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> anyway, today's episode, we are doing Bingo Was or Game Home, the 21st episode out of Season 9. This episode was recorded on February 21st, 1995, and originally aired on March 26th, 1995. And believe it or not, this episode was also directed by Amanda Bears, who played Marcy on Mary Children. Very shocking considering how big of an appearance Marcy had in this episode. Okay? So, um, let's get through the episode, shall we? And then we'll go through some... <laughs> Okay, we, we'll have some fun along the way, and then I'll go through a little bit of trivia before I give you my final rating for the show. Okay? the um, Basically, we are starting... Uh, so, basically, the episode starts with Jefferson and Al sitting uh, down and watching TV while Marcy and Peggy come walking down the stairway, um, standing right behind... Al and Jefferson as they're watching TV. So here we go. Look at it, Jefferson. The elegance, the form, the sheer grace of motion, the triumph of the human spirit. What do you guys think we're watching? You think we're watching Baywatch? It's Monster Trucking. And now, on Monster Trucking, Tyrannosaurus Rex will attempt to mow over nine flaming prison buses. Okay, Marcy and Peg are standing right behind the guys as they're watching Monster Trucking, and Peggy comes right on and says, Boy, PBS has really changed since the Republicans took over. Then Kelly comes in the house with a big stack of mail. Mail call! What do we have? Okay, so Al has bills, which there's a couple. Kelly has fan mail, which is most of the stack. And I think we know who um, has a subscription to Self-Toucher's Quarterly magazine. Bud, have you been... T Bud, have you been playing with yourself again? <laughs> <laughs> I really got to stop playing with myself. <laughs> <laughs> Did I really just say that? <laughs> Let's move on. Then there is a letter for Peggy. Okay? A letter from the Office of Bingo Affairs. Apparently, Peggy has been invited to the Windy City Bingo Invitational. This is the World Series of Bingo. First prize is $10,000. Al doesn't seem to give a shit, and Marcy's trying to throw in some sympathy. 
Well, I think it's a good idea, Peg. So then Peggy asked Marcy to come along. So then you go to the bingo tournament with me? Oh, I would, but... Bingo brings up a really bad memories. I had a dog named Bingo once, who died a very slow, tragic death. Then Jefferson f corrects her and basically puts her in a situation where she's forced to go. I thought you had a cat named Gringo who lived to be a hundred. Oh, I guess I can go. Thank you, honey bun. So, Peggy, do I have enough time to go home and refresh and amend my living will? Of course, Marcy's now pissed off at Jefferson, since Jefferson has put Marcy into a position where she is now forced to attend this uh, bingo invitation that she does not even want to go to. Oh, don't worry about it, Marcy. The bingo tournament is until next Tuesday. And don't worry, Al. This isn't going to cost you one red cent. Good. Give me $300. What for? Bingo clothes! All right, you Denver boot of a woman. So then Marcy and Peggy, they leave the house. And on their way out, Al basically says, Hey, Peggy, what about dinner? Steak? Sounds great. And that allows Al and Jefferson to go back to watching TV. Ah, it's amazing what girls would do, what ladies would do for a thrill. And now, from a word from our sponsor, Girly Girl Beer. <laughs> the official beer of No Ma'am. The official beer of No Ma'am. So now Al and Jefferson are debating what commercial is going to be shown. Al thinks it, Al is hoping that it's a commercial where the girls are washing the car and then they turn the hoses on each other. Oh no! Jefferson is hoping that it's the girls, it's the one where girls are studying the library and then they turn the hoses on each other. <laughs> um, you guys are both wrong. Hi, I'm Yoko Ono, the new spokeshuman for Girly Girl Beer. Because we care about the environment, Girly Girl Beer will donate one nickel per case to save our vanishing rainforest. And now, a song I'm written! Jefferson, give it a remote. <laughs> Yoko Ono singing is so horrible. Al is uh, basically trying to get the remote so he can change the channel, and he can't take it anymore. He can't even take it, so he basically takes that remote and he throws it right at the TV screen, and it destroys the TV in the process. All these cl this cloud of smoke comes out from the television because now it's on fire, and the audience is so out of control. Yeah. Jefferson then replies, Oh, it wasn't enough breaking up the Beatles. Now she's ruined our beer. Jefferson, call an emergency meeting of the troops. No man must pick a new official beer. So then Jefferson heads out the door to go alert the guys that there is a emergency no man meeting to decide a new beer for the no man group. Next scene, Peggy heads back from bingo shopping. I believe it's on Tuesday, the day of the Invitational, because she is sitting there at the dinner table. She's reading these. Uh, she's reading these books on how to play bingo. She's got these bingo cards on the table, and he's got these uh, bingo markers. What can I use for prop around here? Okay, you'll have to. Okay. Then Bud comes walking into the house with a textbook. Apparently he's coming back from his class at Tremaine University. He hears a whole bunch of ruckus in the garage and he asks Peggy, What's going on in the garage? All your, all your fodder in the flap for. I try to come up with a new official beer. So they've already come, so they've already decided on the official pork rind. <laughs> Alright, that 
it's, uh, it keeps scrolling down here. Okay. Yep. So P Al now comes walking out of the garage. Okay. Peg, we need something to clean the pallet between beers. Oh, have you tried toothpaste? No, Peg. Toothpaste is for people who kiss, smile, or eat. Well, if you kissed, you might eat. Yeah, but I wouldn't smile. He then picks up this uh, box of cocoa clumps. Do not sell after 1989. Oh, hell, I'm not selling. I'm eating. Then Bud starts questioning. Hey, listen, Dad. Um, as an outsider of no man, and if there's a God, this family, why would a bunch of guys who are bleary and sober need an official beer? Bud. While no man may look like a loose assortment of foot pads, rakes, and ripsalians, we are, in fact, a proud order of dignified men who serve our community with honor and panache. Then we have Ike and Bob Rooney. Oh, we have Grick, Griff and Bob Rooney. My mistake. They come running out of the garage. Hey, Al, come quick. Ike's got an atomic fireball stuck up his nose. Again? Oh, Danny learned his lesson from the corn dog. But get the video camera. And the dirt devil. Now she's reading. Then it's time for the bingo invitational. Al, just how long are you guys going to be Jim carrying around in there? I need a ride to the bingo terminal. Oh, no, Peg, we're picking a beer. Can't you hitch a ride on Marcy's poultry wagon? Al, the church is in a very dangerous neighborhood. Well, what could happen, Peg? A drive-by plucking? Fine, then don't take me. But I'm going to just bust up your little beer party here and ask some stupid questions about sports. Well, get in the car, Peg. And don't forget, you got to pick me up at 9 o'clock. Fine. And then Griff comes out. Uh, Al, look, we have British Ale. Men, don't forget, British Ale must be served warm. So then you have Bob Rooney and Ike. They take the bottles of ale and they put it in between their armpits. Okay? <laughs> like that's really going to do anything. Okay? So then the next scene, we head to the church where the bingo invitational is being held. All right? Thanks for inviting me, Peggy. The women are wearing my favorite scent. Dust. Oh, now just relax, Marcy. This is going to be fun. Just sit down and soak up the ambulance. <coughs> Somebody's, some old fart is violently coughing off camera. <coughs> and then the host of the Invitational. There is now an open chair at table nine. <laughs> So then we have so basically what we have is we have Peggy who is on the right si who is on the right side of the table. You have Marcy in the middle and then to the left of her is this old lady named Seal who is played by Jean Spiegel Howard. This is her third of four appearances on Married Children. Her first appearance was season 8's Assault and Batteries, an episode that we will be reviewing shortly. Another episode was Season 9's Business Sucks Part 1, where she's on a train with Peggy. How about some banana cream pie? That'll be $50! Then we have this one. And then her last appearance is in Season 10 with Enemies, where she is um, in the diner with her real husband. Oh, Edwin, take me to the bathroom! <laughs> Okay, back to the episode. Marcy wants to play with this marker, and Seal won't let her play with it. Touch that marker, and you'll be eating through a straw like the rest of us. Okay, I guess I'll just sit here and wait till Al comes to pick us up. Seven hours from now. Squeaks the chair once. Seal is over next door. Squeak that chair one more time, and you'll be wishing you were never born like the rest of us. Or as me and my real life, okay, P 
piss me off one more time, and you'll be sucking cock like the rest of us. <laughs> All right? Just a thought. So then about an hour or two, um, and then we have later on, I think it was about an hour or two later on, we um, are seeing the... Okay, we basically see bingo in action. Okay? And Peggy is sitting there playing bingo. I, 28. Peggy um, is playing bingo while Marcy is expressing her concerns about Broomhilda, the rest of her. Peggy, um, I feel a little comfortable around Broomhilda over here. Oh, that's just Seal. She's really nice when you get to know her. Offer her a potato chip. Of course, Peggy is eating potato chips while she's playing bingo. And she offers, a bit, uh, she has uh, Marcy make some peace with Seal by offering a potato chip. So she tries to do that. Would you like a chip? Seal smiles, takes the bag, blows into the bag, closes it up, and, blow, and pops the bag on top of Marcy with the chips that were in it all over Marcy. All right. Next scene, we are back in the Bundy living room. No, oh, we're back in the Bundy kitchen. I mean, Bundy garage, my mistake. All right. The no man meeting is about to get under wraps. All right. With the official voting and tasting for the new official beer of no man. Okay. Back to business. Beer will be judged by nose, body, taste, and color of exit. And remember, no drinking. We will sip, swish, and spit. Ike dissents. I'll sip and spit, but I ain't gonna swish. And Al makes his, gives him an ultimatum. You'll swish and then like it. We will now commence with the official no man beer tasting. Jefferson, would you do the honors, please? All right. So now Jefferson uh, is basically taking over the host. Um, each beer that's going to be tasted is on a silver is on a is on a plate. Okay, the pl there's a bottle of beer. All right, okay. there's one bottle of beer for each member of the group for them to taste. Okay, so let's see what is first on the list. Our first candidate comes from Asia Minor, is made from agave and bladderwort. They take a, a drink of the beer, okay? They, it is so horrible, all right? They, they want to spit it out, but they don't know where to spit it. But then they see this big white box that says wedding dress on it. They run over, they, cl they uh, clear up all of the junk on top of the box, open it up, and spit right on top of Peggy's wedding dress. A <laughs> couple of hours have gone by. Okay. We are now heading for the next candidate. Okay. Our next beer is a fine Afghani ale, whose name loosely translated means Yellow Mountain Runoff. Then Bob Rooney, he winds up, okay. Hey, look, there's a prize in every can. Griff tries to stop. Well, I'd be careful about that prize stuff. Remember, we're from uh, that Chernobyl beer. Then I questions, what? That was an olive, right? <laughs> and Alice responds, Sure, with an eyebrow. Okay, guys, let's forget about this wimpy foreign beer. We're American centric American. Grit Jefferson, what's the first American beer? Dosekes! Yeah! Okay, we're then back to the. We then head back to the bingo terminal. Okay. N41. Marcy cannot take any more of Seal, okay? Peggy, I don't think I can take any more of this. Seal is whispering to Marcy, Shut up! Marcy, don't worry. This is the final game. 
Whoever wins this one takes the big jackpot. Oh. Shut up! Okay. Then Marcy bends over to Peggy. Hey, look, Peggy. All you need is one more little square. Yeah. But I never win anything. I just play for fun. And we'll guess what comes up next. Okay. The lady yells, And 33! Peggy got bingo! Bingo! I got bingo! Bingo! The, uh, the host of the tournament comes running over to verify the card. Seal glad... Uh, Proudly tells Peg, Congratulations, Peggy! And then Marcy gets her revenge, turns around and tells Seal, Shut up! Alright. Then the li then the ho bingo host, Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the $10,000 grand prize, Mrs. Peggy Bundy! Yeah! And then that is commercial break. Let's take a quick commercial break, shall we? And we're back. So coming back in commercial break, uh, all of the bingo attendees, which is pr I think is about at least n I th everybody except for like one or two people are women, okay? And I, and, I, and I think like Peggy and Marcy are the two, they're the only two people at that tournament that are under 65, okay? By looking at the all these other people attending the tournament, okay? So the bingo host pulls out the cash and puts the cash into a brown paper peg for Peggy. And then Marcy asks, Peggy, $10,000, congratulations. What are you going to do with the money? And then Peggy smartly answers, Well, I think I'll give it to the needy, but of course I need it all. Okay, Marcy then says, Oh, it's almost 9 o'clock. Al should be driving up by now. Next scene, back at the Bundy garage. The toilet is flushing, and Al comes out. Okay, Apparently, no mammers are still in, in the process of tasting the beer. And, of course, they still haven't, they haven't drinking anything yet. They're still um, sipping and spitting. Okay? Hey, Al, look, it's 9 o'clock. When are we going to stop sipping and start drinking some of this stuff? Yeah, all this beer foreplay is making me thirsty. What's foreplay? About 10 seconds. Then what's sex? <laughs> And that convinces Al. All right, all right, man. Focus, man, focus. From now on, we'll drink a little beer. But remember, we still must show decorum. Scene then switches, okay? All the no mammers are getting, they're pretty much drunk. You have Ike and Bob Rooney that are trying to, they're th th throwing punches with each other. Claudia Schiffer, Pamela Anderson, Claudia Schiffer, Pamela Anderson. Then uh, Jefferson rings his little bell. <laughs> and then Griff basically um, shouts, <laughs> What is the problem? You guys haven't thrown a freaking punch. And then Bob Rooney comes up. Hey, Al, I don't want to box anymore. Let's dance. But when you were dancing, you wanted a box. Oh, but, but when I was dancing, I didn't get the lead. <laughs> So basically, uh, Al then gets a very bad feeling. Okay, Jay Jefferson, I think I've had a bad. I think I got a bad feeling. Well, heck, you've had about forty beers. It's a wonder you can feel anything. No, I think I was supposed to do something around nine o'clock. What time is it? It's ten fifteen. Oh, that probably already done it. <laughs> hey, Bob Rooney, Bob Rooney, go to the kidneys. Go to the kidneys. Ooh, go to the bathroom. <laughs> All right, so basically now Bob Rooney is sick. We then head back to the church hall, and apparently um, the only people still in there are Peggy and Marcy, as well as the church janitor, who is played by Clint Howard, who is Ron Howard's brother. Okay. 
So that makes two of Ron Howard's res, um, relatives that appeared in this episode. And it's such a fucking shame that how that Ron Howard never actually appeared on the show himself. Okay? But anyway, back to the episode. Um, basically, all of the chairs are up on the t- all of the chairs are up on the table, except for the ones that Peggy and Marcy are sitting on. And meanwhile, the janitor is basically sitting there sweeping and mopping the floors. And then Peggy tells Marcy, Well, staying true to his performance in bed, I think it's safe to say that Al has let me down again. Unfortunately, in this case, I can't just reach into the nice hand and get myself home. Marcy then says, Well, thank goodness we're in the comfort of the church. The janitor says, Ladies, I gotta lock up. Get out. I thought it was a sanctuary. Yeah, until 11. After that, it's just another crime scene. Look, you don't understand. We don't have a ride home, and we're carrying $10,000 in cash. Now, if you make a sleeve, just don't tell us what will happen to us. Oh, I know exactly what will happen to you. But luckily, doctors today, they can reattach almost anything. Take me. Would you believe this isn't my real... <laughs> he bent, he pulls down his pants. He's trying to show his penis to part Peg and Marcy. By the way, did you know this isn't my real penis? <laughs> <laughs> Clint, what the hell is fraud with you? Before he can say penis, which you can't say on Fox, by the way, Marcy intersects. Peggy, I think we should call a cab. You won't catch a ki- you won't find a cab this late at night. You'll never get a cab this time of night. You can get one in the morning if you wouldn't mind checking up with me. I got a hot plate and some macaroni and cheese. Mar- Peggy's actually taking on to his Marcy? And then Marcy turns over and discuss. She's very pissed off with Peggy that she's even considering Clint's o- she's even considering the janitor's offer. And then tells off the janitor. Look, dream date. There's gotta be another way out of here. My cousin Elmo's drives a gypsy cab. He can come get you for $200. I can't believe you are ripping us off in a sacred place. God is going to get you. Yeah, there's so much more he could take from me. Well, we are not paying $200 for a cab, you clave-dwelling pirate. Suit yourself, fucko. Peg and Marcy then head outside the church. They just, they open the doors and head on their way out the church. And just as they step outside... You have gunshots, you have police sirens, you have women screaming in the background. Mm. Tells you how violent it is outside. Okay, and they realize, we don't want this. They head straight back to the janitor. Peggy pops out some cash out of the paper bag and gives it to the janitor. Now we're in the gypsy cab with Elmo in the front yard. Say, girls, who wants to ride the wild Elmo? <laughs> Ron episode. <laughs> but anyway, Elmo is in the t- he's in the front seat. He's driving the gypsy cab, and you have Peggy and Marcy in the background. And you have this um, white trash hillbilly banjo music in the background. <laughs> Sorry for the bumpy ride. It's hard to steer when you're coming off drugs. Hey, watch out! Damn jogger. Or in Arizona, it would be Fucking jaywalker. Um, don't you think you should turn your headlights on? No, but you can feel free to turn on yours. <laughs> okay, Marcy is in discussion. I should report him. What's his name? Dan Rostinkowski? Okay. The cab comes to a halt. Why are we stopping? Well, ma'am... Uh, you see this ankle on my, see this thing on my wrist here? I, um, <laughs> but you see this thing on my leg here? I go two more blocks, I violate my parole, and we explode together. Which is something I've been waiting, I've been hankering for ever since you hot mamas slid in my cab. I think we should get out here. Fine. My buddy Adul will take you the rest of the way. Okay. 
Okay. Then we um, switch camera views. We're in the next cab, a doula. He's got a patch on his eye. And apparently we're in a Geo Metro, and the car is speeding like hell. <laughs> and then you, you have Peggy and Marcy in the background, and they're really scared. <laughs> I find driving to be a real zen experience. I, th I figure the faster you go, the faster you get there. I never knew a Geo Metro would go higher than 40 miles an hour. Yeah, they corner great too. Watch. <laughs> okay, you have um, a doula. <laughs> and then you have Marcy and Peggy. They uh, they wind up swerving and screaming at the top of the lines. <laughs> so then they get out. And they wind up with the next cab with some classical music, and um, a female driver. And it turns out, and it feels like that this um, female driver is very quite normal. But it turns out, well, Annabelle from the Marriage Children podcast worded this perfectly. She's actually batshit insane. The driver that is. All right. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Hey, Peggy is basically sitting there. What a relief to be in a normal cab. You seem like a nice person. Well, I love my work. And then Peggy uh, and then Marcy asks the driver, "How long are you driving?" And then the driver goes, "72 hours straight." Driving's helping forget about the two-timing dirty dog who left me and took everything. But I'll have the last laugh when I find it when he finds out I wrapped his cab around a telephone pole wearing his favorite shirt. <laughs> I'll get your she was only making the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the net to the old next driver. Alright. And this is the last one. It, this guy it's a guy. Who is basically half asleep. Okay. Pe Peggy hits the driver in the in the top of the head as a way of telling him to wake up. And then guess what? The driver falls asleep on the wheel. Next scene. We are uh, back in the Bundy house. We're in the living room. Bud and Kelly are walking down the stairwell. So where's Dad and the rest of the lawn sprinklers? Uh, last night I checked, uh, Buck was giving them sleigh rides. Then we see Buck in the garage wearing antlers tied to a wagon. The whore. The unspeakable whore. Okay. <laughs> Then you have all the no mammers. They're all passed out and asleep. You have Ike and Bob Rooney. Claudia Schiffer. Tastes great. <laughs> oh, look. And then Al. Oh, look, my children. What's her name? And don't worry about me. I'm on the pill. Okay. He's sitting there quietly telling or talking to Bud and Kelly. And then, right in the middle of his talking, Marcy and Peggy come walking into the garage. And Al doesn't know that the two of them are there. Bud, Kelly, when your mother asks about this, and she will, you just tell her we had one beer and went right to sheep. And then... Peggy asks, what if she asked why you didn't pick up your wife? You just tell her because she was too heavy. <laughs> the no members all have a big laugh. And then Al winds up looking up. He said, hey, Pookie, how was bingo? It was great, Al. I won the $10,000. $10,000? Let me see. So then Peggy pulls up whatever's left of the cash Slams it right in Al's hands. This is only three bucks. Then Marcy 
gets up and shouts in Al's ear. Well, that's all we had left after flying away north via the Underground Railroad. Thank you, Father, kids. Thanks, Dad. All this for a new official beer. Griff then says, That's what we've got to do. Pick a new official beer. And then Jefferson, who's half drunk, eh, How about girly girl? Good choice. So all that for nothing. Okay? They were trying, they had to pick a new official beer because Yoko Ono ruined their beer, their girly girl beer. And now that they're drunk and they can't figure out anything, they said, ah, let's forget about Yoko Ono. Let's just suck up to the girly girl beer. Oh, that was easy. Then Al decides to get up. Al, it's 9 o'clock. Where are you going? I got to go pick up the wife. And then he passes out. All over the no other no mammers. Al, you were supposed to have picked up Al, uh, Peggy and Marcy 12 hours ago. Okay? Because you did not pick them up and then you left them at the church and they had to find their own way home, you lost $9,997 because of your stupid ignorance. All right? Well, this is the end of the episode, okay? Pretty kind of Looney Tunish, ish okay? And something you would probably only see, like the, these cab fares and stuff, it does, doesn't really make any sense. But let's briefly go into some trivia, okay? For this episode. So, let's see. We basically already talked about this, but the title of the episode is a reference to the folk song Bingo, also known as And Bingo Was His Name, which is from one of the lines of the song, as well as the American ch game of chance known as Bingo, that Peggy plays and eventually wins. Now, here's one thing I will add about bingo, okay? Bingo in the United States is very huge with senior citizens, okay? Um, in Sun City, a very large retirement community in the northwest corner of the Phoenix Metro here in Arizona, um, all these churches, they play, they host bingo invitationals left and right. You do have to be at least 55 years of age and have no kids under 18 attending K-12 through school in order to be a resident of Sun City. Okay? These old people, like, this is pretty much all they have in their life. Okay? Because a lot of them are retired. Okay? That and hitting the, hitting Sam's Club, Costco, and the supermarkets for all the free food that they have to offer. Those two things are all they have in the life. Okay? So basically, like, um, not only that, but also out... It's also a very... It's also big at the casinos as well. Now, as you probably know, like, outside of Las Vegas and Atlantic City, any casinos in the United States, they have to be owned and operated by Native Americans... And have to be located on Ameri Native American territory. Okay, so the, the, those are the prerequisites. So, like, unless you live in Atlantic City, unless you're from Atlantic City and the state of Nevada, I think are the two, two places where you are allowed to own and operate a casino without having to be a Native American, and you can lo uh, locate a casino. On a piece of land that is not owned, that is not located on a Native American reservation. Okay? So, like all the casinos out here in Arizona, at the very least, they have to be owned. All right? They have to be located on Native American property. Okay? Or on Indian reservations. Okay? And they also have to be owned by Native Americans. And, um, let's see, I know state of Nevada, there's exemptions from that. But, like, the bingo is a big thing that's, that plays part in the casino. 
You also have slots. You also have blackjack and poker and all those other games as well. But bingo is a, one of those big things that, you, and it's very huge among senior citizens. Okay. And then we, like, I remember playing bingo in grade school. Okay. But of course, you had to, it was mainly for like, um, incorporating like studies. Okay. You had to incorporate it into like the subject that you're learning instead of playing like the actual thing. So you basically this. So bingo, for those who don't know, is like B I, it's a bingo card. B I N G O. All right. Uh, let's see if I can, uh, see if I can get the, see if I can try to get that card up and running here. Okay. I will be receiving a new lap, a new computer shortly. So basically, um, it's a bingo card. So you have five numbers across and five numbers. You know, there's 25 spaces on the board. Five across and five up and down. Okay. And basically, what you have is um, they're numbered one. Each letter is um, has 15 different numbers. So like you have B is okay. All the numbers under the letter B they'll range anywhere from one to 15. And then the letter I will range anywhere from 16 to 30. N will range anywhere from 31 to 45, with the middle square usually being a free space. Okay. G will run anywhere from 46 to 60. And then O will run anywhere from 61 to 75. All right. The numbers are drawn at random. So you have this big... Um, like big ball and they had in each and there's different letters in there so like and then they basically you pull a le you have volunteers that'll be up there they'll be p picking the balls one by one and that's um basically they'll announce th the letter and the number four it's like b6 and 41 o 56 all right g56 or oh 69 okay first person usually it's like five across five up and down five diagonally or something like that. okay like it's either it's either five in a row or it's four corners or it's um a pattern or you play the whole board whoever hits whoever finds the match in which in what the game is being followed um they shout bingo like usually it's five five in a row okay once you hit the five in a row you yell bingo somebody comes over to verify it, and then you win a pro whatever prize is being offered in that game so that's what bingo is all about for those of you who do not know how to play it okay and I invite you guys, and I encourage you guys to to play bingo um, at least once in your life. If you have not played it yet, you'll thank me later on that. Okay. So we are okay. So it's done with that. Two of the guest stars in this episode, Gene Spiegel Howard and Clint Howard, are the mother and brother of American director actor Ron Howard. This is Clint Howard's only appearance on Married Children. Gene Spiegel Howard will has three other appearances. We've also we've already reviewed um, enemies, in which is Jean's final appearance, and I we will shortly be reviewing her first appearance, Assault and Batteries, well, that was uh, that aired back in season eight. Okay. Basically, um, and speaking of her, she who who play, she plays Seal in this episode. She previously appeared. As Sylvia, the lady who sit next to Peggy on the train, Business Sucks Part 1, and as the lady on the row of carts who cuts in front of Alan Assault and Batteries. Starting with this episode, Christina Applegate has a noticeably shorter haircut, which appears to be chin-length bob cut, and keeps it to the next season. She has previously cut her hair to a shoulder-length bob at the beginning of Season 9. David Faustino appears to be shaved, to have, he appears to have shaved his facial hair 
off in this episode, his facial hair returns in the next episode, which is user friendly. Okay. Now we're moving on to cultural references. As Peggy, uh, so here's one thing I should talk about. Um, Peggy and Marcy, they come down the stairs and watch and, and see Alan Jefferson watching monster trucking, and Peggy says, "Boy, PBS has really changed since Republicans took over." This is in reference to the 104th United States Congress, in which the Republican Party took over both control of both uh, the House and the Senate during the U.S. during Democratic U.S. President Bill Clinton's third and fourth years of office. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Okay. The 94 midterms was a huge blow to the Democratic Party, especially after some of the shit that um, Bill and his wife Hillary were trying to shove through Congress. Okay, Now, um, over the previous 40 years, like between 1956 and 1995, control of the Senate has bounced back and forth between the Republicans and the Democrats. But the House has been in complete control of the Democrats for about 40 consecutive for about 40 consecutive years so like uh, i think it was since 19 oh come on i did not I did not want that okay so it's the first time since 1955 so about 40 years that uh republicans had control of the house and the first time since the 83rd congress that republicans uh, had control of both branches of congress okay uh, there, uh, some of the legislation that they wind up trying to, that Bill and his wife Hillary were trying to shove through Congress, their attitude was, we have, okay, we have the White House, we have c both branches of Congress, we can shove anything through that we want, and the Republicans cannot do anything to stop us. And normally, like, and my father, who grew up during this time, he basically had told me, um, because I was way too little or didn't not to understand any of that. So he basically told me, Republican congressmen, they usually didn't show up for votes because they knew that their votes wouldn't matter. But once Bill Clinton took over and started shoving certain measures of legislation through, they stood up, they started attending the voting and started to let their voices be heard and proving to the voters that they really care. And they basically put together a contract for America that Newt Gingrich had led and it resulted in Republicans sweeping um, the mid the 94 midterm election so for example the 1990 uh, so before um, the 100 so from so in late 1994 um, when the previous uh, Congress ended we had 53 Democrats and 47 Republicans in the U.S. Senate for a total of 100 people. When the new Congress switched over in January of 95, those numbers switched. Okay, You had uh, basically 53 Republicans and 47 Democrats in the U.S. Senate. And then in 1996, when the, the next election was held, the number of Republic, basic Republicans got a slight increase in the number of seats, going from 53 to 55 Republicans to 45 Democrats in the Senate. Okay, so each U.S. state gets two U.S. senators, and each senator's term lasts for six years. Okay, for those of you who do not know, and then at like every two years, a third of the Senate is up for re-election. Meanwhile, over in the House of Representatives, every sing each term lasts two years. And you can run as many times as you want as long as you keep winning. There's no term limits in Congress, unlike the presidency, which is uh, set at eight years or two full terms. Okay, So in December of 94, uh, we that Congress ended with 256 Democrats, one independent, and 177 Republicans. And it and uh, and it um, we went into January of '95 at the beginning of the new Congress with 230 Republicans, 204 Democrats, one Independent. And then at the end of that Congress, they wind up finishing at the uh, at the end of that particular Congress 
with 235 Republicans, 197 Democrats, and one Independent. And then in the 19, after the 96 elections, uh, Democrat Rep Republicans lost a few seats, but they retained control, and they would retain control through the 2006 election, which the Democrat, which was halfway through George W. Bush's second term in office. Okay, that is all we're going to talk about regarding the politics. If you don't want to, uh, we're not uh, a political show. Okay, but this is what we had to talk about in order for you to understand that joke. As Pegging noted, during this time, Republican leaders were proposing to eliminate federal funding of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the group responsible for PBS and NPR, and making it private instead with the joke that the Republicans would put something as mindless as monster trucking instead of educational shows as Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on the network if it would be, if were to be privatized. It also leave those in more rural areas with less programming to watch and listen to it if it were to be defunded. Okay? On the other hand, some have noted that Republicans wanted to eliminate funding for PBS and NPR is due to CPR receiving um, government money during times of budgeted, budget deficits. Around 95, it was receiving over $200 million from the government and in more recent years has received over $400 million. In more recent times, additional arguments have been made because of PBS and NPR having liberal bias and politicizing their programs, despite its objective to being as fair and balanced as possible. When no man decides to go to American beer finally, Jefferson says that the first is Dos Equis. It's not an American beer. It's a real brand of beer from Mexico brewed by the Qualitamac Moctezuma Brewery, and do I uh, do apologize for butchering it, but my Spanish is not that good. Despite the fact I have a coworker, Erica, who's been teaching me Spanish, it's not we're still a long way from being perfect. Some of the beer cans that can be seen at the meeting include Coors, Old Milwaukee, and Budweiser. After the guys start drinking, Ike and Bob Rumi start fighting over Claudia Schiffer, who is a German fashion model, and Pamela Anderson who was a former Playboy playmate who had previously appeared on Married Children during Al's Fantasies in Season 5. It is revealed that the girly girl beer's new spokeswoman is Yoko Ono, who was an artist and singer who became the best known for her involvement in, with British musical group The Beatles when she began dating and later marrying one of the band's members, John Lennon. Jefferson mentions that Yoko first... Uh, ruined the Beatles and now their beer. It's in reference to acquisitions that Yoko Ono was responsible for the group's breakup in 1969 following her budding relationship with Lennon. Janitor's character, who is Mullen, played by Clint Howard, says Marcy Darcy, uh, she calls her a bucko, B-U-C-K-O. This is most likely an in-joke towards Clint Howard's real-life brother, Ron Howard, who uh, basically had used the phrase frequently when he appeared on the 1970s uh, TV show Happy Days. All right. So now for my um, rating for this episode. All right. This episode, I love the episode very much. It's one of my favorites for the, epi for the whole season. And it's also one of the first batch of episodes that I remember watching when I came across the show in 2002. And I loved it so much, it inspired me to keep watching. Okay, Yes, there. I do have some arguments regarding this uh, show, or regarding this episode, that is. Okay. Uh, first is, um, why is it costing $9,997 to ride cat? Like, how far is this church from the Bundy house? Number one. Number two. How many di how far how, how many different caps do they wind up taking? And number three, why is it costing nine thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollars to drive all these caps? Okay. And doesn't uh, Chicago have public transportation? Okay. So um, these are the different questions I have in my mind. Second is. Um, I found it to be a waste of time. Like at the very end, like the whole objective was to pick a new official beer for No Man after the Yoko Ono ruined their beer. And then at the very end of the day, they basically decided to go back to Girly Girl because they 
can't seem to make up their mind and they uh, just got too drunk to even worry about it. And then now, 12 hours after he was supposed to pick up Peggy Marcy, he finally remembers after P Peggy had brought it up. Good thing Peggy won the $10,000 prize, otherwise Peggy and Marcy, none of them would have made it back home safely. All right? So that's what I have to say about the episode. When the Married Children podcast reviewed this episode about a year and a half, I think it was about a year and a half ago, they reviewed this episode, and they gave it um, ratings in the middle range. Like they, they weren't too thrilled about it, and they gave it like an, it was an okay score. Me, on the other hand, all right, um, I know Annabelle from the Married Children podcast, she called me batshit insane. For get, or Mr. Insane, that is, for um, giving the rating that I'm giving it. But under the circumstances of how I came across this episode and how much I liked it and how much it inspired me to continue watching the show, it uh, basically is going to get a 5 out of 5. To me, this is a Hall of Fame episode because you have no ma'am, you have, okay, you, you have no ma'am in there, which is a huge part of the show. And then you also have um, Peggy, who's always asking for money. Um, you do, you, there is not a, a lot of Peggy, in, I mean, Kelly and Bud. But it does uh, show, like, have a little bit of, you know, like, what each character is about. So that is my review for today. I will be back next time for another classic episode of Married Children. If there's a specific episode from the first 10 seasons you would like Mr. Wildcat to review, please make sure you leave your, your suggestions in the comments section below. Until the next time we meet, I'm Mr. Wildcat reminding each and every one of you to be good, be careful, and behave.